Hi, and welcome to my favorite games of the year. First up's Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown. I hate that Lockheed Martin was involved, but with that out of the way, it's still a great video game. Ace Combat 7 actually does a fantastic job of working around the involvement of one of the world's biggest war corporations by pitting players not against human, but machine enemy forces. The result, ironically, seems resonant with the reported experiences of Japanese fighter pilots in World War II. The Allies, after all, had high-tech next-gen weapons of war like chaff, radar, and B-29s, which flew at high altitudes. It must have conjured a similar kind of terror for the Japanese Air Force as Ace Combat 7's almost alien-looking enemy drones. This one's mine. The game uses superb visual effects, like windscreen condensation after flying through clouds, as well as a ton of different planes that not only look but play different from one to the next. Refueling initiated. Maintain your current position. Its near-future setting and creative approach makes Ace Combat 7 stand out in a rather otherwise homogenous field of flight simulators. I got a trailer in my sight. Getting out of the box. Thinking. Next up, Life is Strange 2. It would have been easy for Don't Nod to follow the breakout success of Season 1 with more of the same. Strangely, instead, Life is Strange Season 2 embarks down an entirely different road altogether. Instead of another straight Telltale style modern adventure game, Season 2 innovates a mechanic of vicarious consequences I've never seen before. Playing as Big Brother Sean, your decisions will influence Daniel, your 9 year old hermano, in a very unique and surprisingly naturalistic way. Season 2 also sets out to push the envelope for creative expression like the original, but in different, much more directly political ways. Yes, Life is Strange 2 is a reflection on the meaning of America in the age of Trump. The game bravely takes on sensitive subjects like this, most of them rarely or never before seen in gaming before. And while there's less mechanical cohesion across episodes than Season 1, which stayed relatively static throughout, this erratic assemblage of set pieces has its benefits. And unlike Quantic Dreams games, in Life is Strange 2, different actions actually feel different to play. Trimming marijuana, for example, has a scissory snip to it. It isn't all quite as samey as David Cage's games. Life is Strange 2 also follows through excellently with Season 1's most intriguing element, using interactivity to explore concepts like society and morality. In both seasons, I'm reminded of the famous spy poet James Jesus Angleton, who compared the experience of working in espionage to getting lost in a wilderness of mirrors. I never know who to trust in Life is Strange, and I'm always mistaking impressions for reality. The complexity and beautiful confusion, the strangeness, of being human is what at bottom Life is Strange sets out as a series to express. Finding a way to integrate this core idea with political, cultural, and historical commentary is what makes season two much more than a sequel or simple rehash. Next up, speaking of Trump's America, there is Death Stranding, a game by some developer named Hideo Kojima. To be more accurate, Death Stranding is not only about Trump, but rather the end, the death of the so-called American century post-World War II. You know, the world was different when I was a kid. America is a country. Anybody can go anywhere they damn well please. No need for the couriers like yourself. You had highways, airplanes. Hell, you could even visit other countries. Hard to imagine it now. This informs everything about Death Stranding. Even the specific major references to movies are all from late stage Hollywood. When it isn't alluding to such post 9 11 hits as Lord of the Rings and Castaway, very much like Life is Strange 2, Death Stranding takes us into a past so far removed it may as well be prehistoric. This forgotten yesterday America gets conveyed both visually and mechanically. 
in Death Stranding. You won't just be visiting a near future resembling classic American periods like the Dust Bowl or the Antebellum South or the Western Frontier or the Gilded Age of the Gold Rush. Playing as Sam Porter Bridges feels like some representation of every American heroic conceit combined. Like every Kojima game, Death Stranding reflects on the transition from the 20th century to the 21st. That's made clear from everything, from Sam's resemblance to astronauts, pilgrims, cowboys, daredevil, stuntmen, and postmen, to the game's many, many creepy nods to 9-11. But Death Stranding is uniquely, for obvious reasons, situated in Kojima's au revoir to comment upon the 21st century. The intense gameplay makes a struggle out of simply walking out the door, while requiring something else rarely if ever required by a game before, namely emotional labor. Death Stranding takes a toll on your psyche to satirize the dehumanization brought into the world by the gig economy. Even though I have yet to actually complete the game, I can already tell that Death Stranding is brilliant on so many levels. Currently, my favorite aspect has to do with how its core gameplay loop epitomizes the millennial experience as a constant nomadic search for recognition inside a sea of meaningless, ultimately unnecessary, work for work's sake. This game has a lot of layers to it, so please try to play for a while before concluding you even know for sure what Death Stranding is about. I'm about 50 hours in and I'm still not sure that I know it myself. But in this regard, Kojima's newest game seems to be trying to reincarnate the experience of becoming engrossed in an art house movie or an old album whose mysteries and nuance would draw you back over and over again. And the brave, even foolhardy way that Death Stranding appears to challenge every major global force from Disney to the military, medical, and educational industrial complex, all without glamorizing or endorsing violence or terrorism, demonstrates Hideo Kojima's still the same bold, revolutionary auteur and provocateur as always. Next up, Resident Evil 2. The remake of 1998's Resident Evil 2 has been everything I'd hoped and more. For a full-length review, see the video in the description. But to summarize, I was impressed by how Capcom managed to translate what was a decidedly static camera original into a modern 3D survival horror action game. Survival horror and zombie games generally owe a lot to this series, of course, and this year, yet again, Resident Evil managed to add something new to it, an otherwise rather decomposing and antiquated genre. Next up, Devil May Cry 5. Yeah, Capcom had a great year, to say the least. Devil May Cry, much like the Resident Evil remake, needed not so much a rebirth as a total reformation, and Devil May Cry 5 was the perfect result. Everything about the best DMC games, 1 and 3 specifically, got recontextualized and reinvented this year for a new generation, and the goofy humor came along for the ride, which I was very glad to see. I was also amazed how little Dante there was at the start of Devil May Cry 5. This went a long way towards the impression that, again, like the RE2 remake, DMC5 isn't going to be content with resting on its laurels. Subtracting the main character for a while forced both the devs and the player to adapt. With more playable characters than I believe ever before for the series, the core idea of Devil May Cry feels finally fleshed out. While Resident Evil's all restraint, DMC allows you to break that survival horror tension and just let loose. This is what makes that wacky attitude and delightfully trashy showboating necessary. The techniques Capcom used to block out Devil May Cry 5's action sequences, meanwhile, borrow from some of the best Japanese action games ever made, including the original Resident Evil 2 and many early entries in the Metal Gear Solid series. Things like the many prosthetic arms in Devil May Cry 5 and your ability to replay levels for higher scores also reminded me of something I've loved about this series from the earliest game how it reinvents elements from arcade games and translates them into a console or home gaming space. Next up we have Total War Three Kingdoms. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is one of, if not the, quintessential work of Chinese literature. The Total War series is one of, if not the, quintessential name in PC strategy games. Seeing them work so well together shouldn't surprise me, but it does. The focus on legendary adventurers and epic heroes works well by borrowing from more menu-heavy, complex strategy games like Crusader Kings or Europa Universalis to flesh out court intrigue without overloading you as much as those games do with trade, economic policy, and administration. 
Total War Three Kingdoms also has this awesome, unusual format that you know that there's going to be a final protracted struggle between three imperial states. If it won't be you commanding one of those three by the end, you damn well better hope you're on friendly terms with at least two of them. There's also the subject emotion stat. Whenever one of my sulking generals or administrators decides to try to have me killed for not promoting them high enough. Next up, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Games set in Japan rarely do well worldwide. Sekiro was only possible, for example, as a joint operation between From Software and the creators of an old Japanese stealth game called Tenshu. This leveraged the name recognition and profile of From Software's Souls games with the stealth and feudal Japan scenarios of the less popular but still excellent Tenshu Assassin franchise. The result that we got this year is something unique in 2019 that, not unlike the Resident Evil 2 remake, harkens back to an era when Japan still ruled the waves. It could also readily be compared to Death Stranding in a sense. Both are technicians games, designed to frustrate and repel those who try to plow through them with the mindlessness of brute force. Sekiro isn't the best stealth game by itself, but you have to factor in how hugely different it's set out to be from, say, Dark Souls 3, without losing that on-the-edge-of-your-couch intensity and precision offered by From Software's best games. The element that reminded me the most of Tenshu would have to be the increased emphasis in Sekiro on single-use weapons, as well as ambushing. The assassinations, such as they exist in this game, don't really bring you the Hitman-like satisfaction anymore, like the earlier Tenshu games did. It's more like Dark Souls, in how it feels like facing down an unstoppable foe who's blocking your progress. But that doesn't mean that the game particularly suffers for being less like Tenchu. Next up, Mutant Year Zero. Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden has a retro-futuristic fetish like a lot of pop culture today. It's the best kind of campy, playing like a scrappier XCOM with more resource management and guerrilla warfare. It's a Blade Runner fucked Howard the Duck and E.T. with some Mad Max and Ninja Turtles sandwich. I'd recommend it. Does that automatically make me a furry? <laughs> Imagine if, instead of some high-tech outfit out of Tom Clancy like we have in XCOM, that you were more like hobos out of the Great Depression, forced to comb post-apocalyptic ruins for scrap and rare materials. This is a conceit that works. It's a worn universe, like in Star Wars or Blade Runner. That's what gives Mutant Year Zero its charm. Also, the duck. Uh, Disco Elysium's on my list. I've already uh, reviewed it in a full-length video. Next up, we have The Outer Worlds. It's been nothing short of sad to see Bethesda run a great IP like Fallout into the ground. Fallout 4 was a serviceable enough follow-up to Bethesda's first in the franchise, Fallout 3, but it was no New Vegas. New Vegas had been made by Fallout's real parents, no longer called Black Isle, but Obsidian. Unlike Fallout 3 and 4 and, uh, 76, New Vegas demonstrated a genuine understanding of what had made the first two Fallout games on PC so compelling back in the merry old 90s. But when rather infamously, New Vegas had scored one point lower than Bethesda had specified from Metacritic, the dev team's bonus was withheld. It was this little incident that may well have given birth to what became Outer Worlds, which debuted this year. It's Obsidian's first post-Fallout game, in every sense of that phrase. In this giant game, everything Bethesda's run of Fallouts have tried and failed to accomplish. Mostly thanks to their design environment that was largely imported from Elder Scrolls, Outer Worlds all but makes a point to achieve. Let's start with combat. Outer Worlds makes modern Fallout games, frankly, look like janky pieces of shit. With heavy inspiration taken from James Cameron's Aliens, firefights in the Outer Worlds are like typhoons that swirl all around you in real time. Or in slow-mo, should you trigger one of the special companion moves on the D-pad. These dynamic breaks in the unmitigated flood of action give the player a sense of control over a chaotic flow of battle. And secondly, of course, there's just the fact that Outer Worlds is a much better RPG than anything Bethesda has made in years. With a bevy of multiple options and an insane amount of replay value, Outer Worlds is a game that I'll be playing for maybe years to come. I'm just that type of person. I like to play through RPGs like this and see all the different systems that they have. 
I can't say that I've really done that with a Bethesda game and I, in a long time, and I don't see myself ever doing it again. But we have Outer Worlds, and hopefully it will inspire a new generation of post-Fallout games like itself. Finally released in its ultimate form this year on PC, Rockstar Games' Red Dead Redemption 2 is a sweeping epic set in the fading light of the Wild West. It depicts an era rarely seen in games, not only with its narrative, but with its mechanics. That era being the Progressive Era in the United States. Generally, writes the Britannica, Progressivism was a response to problems raised by the rapid industrialization and urbanization that followed the Civil War. These problems included the spread of slums and poverty, the exploitation of labor, the breakdown of democratic government caused by the emergence of political organizations or machines allied with business interests, and a rapid movement towards financial and industrial concentration." End quote. If we look at Red Dead Redemption 2, we see the progressive and gilded periods in U.S. history. Leviticus Cornwall is to one what the Gang of Dutch Vanderlyn is to the other. And in a sense, our protagonist, Arthur Morgan, is the spitting image of the Christ-like figures that proletarian fiction in America at the turn of the century would depict in their tragedies of the American working classes. Red Dead Redemption 2 is about the very concept of modernization and society as such. It's also about revolutions and the point at which ideals meet reality. So it's fitting in a sense that the game now saddles two entirely different platforms, console and PC. And boy does it look and play great on PC. Stay tuned, I've got a feature linked video on Red Dead 2 in the works. Well, that about does it. I'm your host, Joran, saying adios. Until next time, boss.